Let's pray this together. Eternal Father, you are good beyond all measure, but I am lowly, wretched, and poor. My lips are ready to confess, but my heart is slow to feel, and I am reluctant to change my ways. I bring my soul to you, that you would soften it, heal it, and mold it. Reveal sin's ugliness to me, that I may hate it, despise it, and flee from it. I have seen the purity and beauty of your perfect word, yet I daily violate and transgress its precepts. Your loving spirit works within me, but I choose sin to my own hurt. All this I mourn, and I ask for your forgiveness. Create in me more profound and lasting repentance. Give me a godly grief that trembles and fears, yet ever trusts and loves. Through repentance, let me see more clearly the glory of the saving cross. I want to ask that everybody be reminded at this time um, to hear the good news of God's forgiveness from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt, that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. I would ask that you join me in prayer as we prepare for our scripture reading today. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we are able to gather here today corporately to hear your word. We pray for Pastor Dennis as he prepares to preach to us today that you would give him holy inspiration, Lord, that he'd be able to prepare and preach this word truthfully and honestly to all of us, that we may be enlightened to the state of our own sin, God, our state of our own separation from you, and how great we are in need of your mercy and your forgiveness. In your name we pray, amen. And at this time, I want to invite Pastor Dennis up for the preaching of our word. Before we get there, this, each morning we celebrate what is called communion or the Lord's Supper. We do want to invite every baptized believer who trusts in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins to participate with us. If this is you, I ask that you uh, join me on my left or my right uh, to um, come and take the bread and cup and hold on to them as we, take, we will partake in them together. If this is not you... And if you are a believer that have not been baptized, I do want to encourage you to consider the importance of obedience when in, in regards to baptism. Or if you are not a believer in Christ, today is not the day for you to take the bread and cup, but it can be the day that you take hold of Christ and believe. If you have any questions about what it means to believe and follow Jesus, I want to invite you to talk to me or our deacon. Victor this morning, and we'll be happy to answer any questions and happy to be able to share a little bit more what it means to follow Jesus. During this time, as you wait in line um, or line up and wait for, or wait for others, it could be a time for you to consider some of the songs we have sung or even the prayers that you have prayed or even the confession that we have confessed together. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite you to stand and, um, and line up as we partake in the, uh, take the elements together. <laughs> 
As we partake in the bread and the cup, we receive Christ in all of his benefits. We have our faith nourished, and we get a foretaste of the heavenly feast that awaits us. The bread and cup is also a symbol and representation of the gruesome death of Jesus Christ, nailed to the cross for the sins of many. We receive this sacrament as a sign and seal of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 24 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Verse 25, 26 says, In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in gratefulness, reminded of what your Son has done for us. The body that was nailed to the cross as a payment and sacrifice for sin, that offered forgiveness for many. And I thank you, Lord, that you have shown your great love and your mercy through your Son, that you will stir in the hearts of all those this morning that will turn to you, will love you, follow you, and trust you all the days of our lives. And I pray, Lord, as we continue to be reminded of what your Son has done through the Lord's Supper, that it would encourage us every single moment, day in and day out, of what it means to live for you and trust with you. For all this in your Son's name, amen. A catechism is a question and answer method of discipleship, which gives the believer an opportunity to learn valuable truths of the faith, so that their hearts may be transformed and that they will grow in Christ's likeness. I will read a question from the New City Catechism, and then I will invite you to respond with me as we recite our answer together. This morning, we have, we'll be answering question 25. Does Christ's death mean all of our sins can be forgiven? Yes, because Christ's death on the cross fully paid the penalty for our sin. God graciously imputes Christ's righteousness to us as if it were our own, and will remember our sins no more. This is a beautiful gift from the Lord where we are reminded that there is nothing we can add or contribute to our forgiveness and salvation. Here we learn what we, call this, what we would call the great exchange, the double imputation of our sins to Christ on the cross and Christ's righteousness given to us. This morning, as we are continuing in our First Corinthians sermon series, the first part of our message will be dealing with some slightly sensitive topics, which is a continuation from last week. So I do want to give parents of all elementary school students the option, if you choose, for them to attend the Christ, Kids for Christ program this Sunday. Normally, it is up to nine years old, but for this Sunday, for children up to the fifth grade, you can attend this Sunday. At this time, I would like to dismiss our children up to fifth grade today. And for the rest of us, I'd like to invite you to please stand and hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a woman, uh, for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to sell yourselves to prayer, but then, come again, but, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself, myself am, but each has his own gift from God. 
one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to, be, to marry than to, than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, your, how do you know wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. When I was in college, I signed up for a very popular elective class called Human Sexuality and Relationships. In one of the first classes, the professor asked the whole class who thought falling out of love is an acceptable reason for getting a divorce. It was, it was not a surprise for me that the majority of the class rose their hands agreeing that falling out of love is acceptable, an acceptable reason for getting a divorce. But it was a surprise to me of how great the majority of the class rose their hands. Afterwards, he told everyone to put their hands down and asked if anyone disagreed whether this was uh, acceptable, that falling out of love was not an acceptable reason for getting a divorce. I nervously put my hands up in the air along with maybe 10 other people in the class of perhaps of 100 students. It was very clear that the, who rose their hand, and I can feel the eyes looking towards my general direction, especially when the professor looked at me and asked why I rose my hand. The understanding of marriage, of what it entails and how permanent it should be, was just as shaky in the first century. You might think, oh, we understand as today, yeah, sure, people get no default divorces all the time, but in the first century, this was actually happening quite a bit as well. And probably unsurprisingly, the understanding of marriage was also not that clear in the Corinthian church. After all, they had plenty of challenges dealing with sexual immorality, whether within the church or even in their own lives. We just preached last week and went through last week how they were struggling with the sexual immorality of going and visiting prostitutes and what does it mean for them and what does purity look like for themselves. For us this morning and every Sunday we gather, we are committed to preaching the Bible fully and faithfully as we are carefully walking through the book of First, first Corinthians. And so we are going to hit on some very interesting topics that might not be one completely practical for all of us this morning or two something that is a passage that we might not think would be something we would willfully choose on our own but it is okay because I think today and this morning as we are reminded that all of God's word is fruitful for our lives that even as we go through a passage like this that might feel awkward or uncomfortable, that it will continue to shape our hearts and our minds on the biblical truths and sharpen our hearts and our minds so we can live out these realities when that time comes. In this passage, as we have read together this morning, gets practical very quick, dealing with many of the challenges in marriage. We have already had an opportunity, even in the book of 1 Corinthians, to meet Paul the theologian, and also we have probably have met Paul the evangelist. And as we read this letter, we have also been kind of uh, introduced to Paul 
the apostle and how he conducts himself in that way. But today we get to meet Paul the pastor and his kind of pastoral characteristics that come out in this passage. And so for us, this passage this morning is teaching this and is arguing this, that faithfulness in marriage is expressed through deep intimacy and commitment. Faithfulness in marriage is expressed through deep intimacy and commitment. We will have two points this morning. The first point, verses 1 through 9, marriage is fully giving yourself to the other. And second, our commitment to Christ guides our commitment to our spouse, verses 10 through 16. And well, we will start with verses 1 through 9 this morning with that first point. Marriage is fully giving yourself to your spouse. Like I mentioned earlier, we get to see Pastor Paul here teaching on some very specific topics. The Apostle Paul has written a previous letter to the Corinthian church. It was mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, that Paul has written this letter. We don't have this letter. It was lost. But he's written this letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthians wrote back to him. And here, this is actually the second letter of 1 Corinthians. It's very confusing. There's four letters written to the Corinthian church, but we only have two of them. And so this is the second letter, the first, uh, 1 Corinthians, where he writes back. This is... Uh, uh, this is why he's addressing it in this way in verse 1. Paul has written about sexual immorality to this church before, and this is not the first time he has addressed this issue. Now, there are some in the church that thought, that, thought, uh, that thought this would include advocating for celibacy in the marriage. You see, the church had some very big and different extremes when it came to how they dealt with the physical body how they dealt with this particular issue. We saw last week, some thought that your body didn't matter. It was going to get destroyed anyway, and it might as well live however we want and do whatever the body, you know, craves because it's ultimately going to get destroyed. So they're just, they, they saw the body in this way where they're saying, doesn't matter what we do here on earth. Jesus saved the soul. The body doesn't matter, which we saw that Paul rebuked and said, no, that is completely not true. Though there's now also a group on the other hand that thought that they had a very low view of the body. So instead of giving into it and into whatever desires that the body wants, they went the opposite way and said they should just deny the body of any sort of sexual pleasures. And still others giving into the pattern of the culture they understood sex in marriage is not supposed to be for any sort of pleasure, but actually for procreation. And so for them, they thought, my goal is that with my wife is I am to procreate with my wife, but any sort of pleasure I derive will go to the prostitutes and I'll go elsewhere, which that's what was going on a little bit as well with these feasts that they were having at the temple that we discussed last week. So Paul is trying to address the twisted thinking and warped understanding from the Corinthian church. He isn't trying to be exhaustive in the teaching of marriage. So I think it's actually really important for us to understand what he really believes about marriage and in this context. Because at the same time, while we are seeing him address a very specific issue, we need to understand Paul's theology when it comes to marriage. And his teaching of marriage, we see a little bit more extensively, actually, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 32. And in that passage, he says this. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. In other words, the way that Paul understood and taught marriage between the husband and the wife is actually a tangible display of Christ's love and care for the church. And in that whole passage, that's the point that he was getting at, that the marriage between this husband and this wife, even though they have different roles and how this was all played out, that it ends up being a picture, a very tangible picture of the gospel for themselves, for the church, and for the people around them. Paul is arguing that marriage is a selfless, sacrificial, loving type of expression that points to Christ's sacrificial love for his people. In other words, simply put, the whole picture of marriage, according to Paul and what he's been teaching, is that it is supposed to be a declaration and a picture of the gospel, the sacrificial, selfless love of Christ that saved a people that's undeserving. See, the gospel tells us that because of God's great love and great mercy, he sends Jesus, his, the Son of God, to come down to be our Redeemer and Savior. He came down to take the punishment of sin for people like us. He was the perfect sacrifice, a spotless and righteous sacrifice, crucified on a Roman cross. And then three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. This death on the cross as a replacement punishment for all those who place their trust and hope in him, just like the question 25 that we read this morning. And as we turn away from our sins and turn towards Jesus by faith and trust, we will be saved. And his resurrection is our hope that we too have new life with him from now till eternity. This picture of the gospel is supposed to be displayed in the marriage of a husband and his wife. And so this is the foundation of Paul's understanding of marriage. The foundation for marriage should be the foundation for our marriages as well. And with that foundation, the context of what the Corinthians believed about Sexual intimacy and sexual immorality should actually be flowing from that basic, uh, that basic understanding of what does it look like if your marriage is actually a reflection of the gospel. So Paul is responding and addressing very specific errors that flow from their error of understanding what marriage truly is. And Paul is arguing that marriage is fully giving yourself to your spouse because, as we saw in Ephesians, because it's supposed to be a picture of the gospel. And fully giving yourself to your spouse is also expressed in sexual intimacy. And Paul is arguing there's a difference between sexual immorality, which was discussed last week, and sexual intimacy, which is something that is shared between a husband and his wife. There is nothing immoral, but it's actually something to be enjoyed and celebrated when these gifts are used in its proper context within the confines of marriage. But he doesn't just tell them to do that, but he's actually teaching the kind of the theological reasonings behind it. In verse 4, he says, as a husband and wife are united as one flesh, he argues that not only a wife does not have authority over her own body, which would actually be the common cultural understanding at that time. The husband, the you know, kind of very patriarchal, the man of the house, that the wife belongs to him. And so when they read that, they probably didn't think too much about that. That was probably what they understood, the culture to see marriage. But what was actually incredibly countercultural and would have caught their attention was when he said that likewise, husbands, does not have, they do not have authority over their own bodies, but their, their wife does. This would catch their attention. But what Paul is arguing, essentially, is that marriage is a selfless giving of yourself to the other, that they're both giving of themselves to the other. It isn't a one-way deal. 
It isn't just because, oh, you're the husband, so therefore you get all these rights, but the wife doesn't. It is a selfless giving. It's both parties selflessly giving themselves a selfless serving of one another. And here he says that, showing that the display of intimacy in marriage, the relational, emotional, and physical close, closeness uh, is in the conjugal rights of the spouse. Sexual immorality is using another's body for your own pleasure, a selfless using for your own pleasure. The other person is not seen as a person, but treated only in a physical sense. But the beauty of sexual intimacy in marriage is the giving of yourself for the other and for their joy and their pleasure. And so this here we see is not something that's demanded or lorded over another. It isn't like a, your body is mine and I get to do whatever I want with it, but it is a I belong to you and I want to selflessly give and serve you type of attitude. And so when the husband and the wife both approach with that attitude and posture, we see marriage lived out in a very faithful, selfless way. But it's also incredibly important to realize, you might be saying, yes, this is talking about sexual intimacy, but the selfless giving of yourself is not only expressed in this way. For the husband and their wife, and for our husbands and wives here this morning, we are constantly and need to be constantly challenged on considering how do we selflessly give and serve, whether my husband or my wife, in all sorts of ways. So many times, no matter how it is in relationships, we want to demand our rights, desire some sort of fairness, whether how we spend money or how we spend time or who does the chores, who picks the vacation spot, who, who does this or that, who takes care of the kids. You changed the diapers last time, now it's, you know, it's, or I changed it last time, now it's your turn. Whatever it may be, we are constantly maybe in our hearts and in, the, in our temptation is that we desire our way. We want our rights. But here we're learning what does it look like for a spouse to selflessly give to the other? How do we put our spouse ahead of us? Because verse 4 has greater implications than just the marriage bed. It is also incredibly important that the selfless giving of yourself, even though, yes, it is in sexual in intimacy, is not only expressed here. For the husbands and wives this morning, we are constantly learning what does it look like to elevate our uh, constantly look like to how do we elevate our wives and our husbands, putting them before us instead of learning or desiring to put ourselves first. You see, this is only a physical representation of what the whole marriage should look like. It should be a picture of the gospel in giving and selflessness not only when it comes to the intimacy part, but actually in all parts of the relationship, the relational intimacy. But at the same time, sexual intimacy in marriage should not be elevated beyond its proper place and idolized. Verse 5, Paul says, hey, there, I wish you would, under." Like, verse 5 actually shows that, um, that there's actually specific scenarios that the couple would mutually agree to fast and pray. That he says that they can come together, uh, and though they might they though they might come together later on as a protection against sin. So this isn't a you need to serve me at all cost type of attitude, or you owe me, or I owe you. But even they say when in the fasting portion, it is a mutually agreed upon decision. Paul also wants the Corinthians to understand that celibacy is not a second-tier status. To not idolize marriage to the point that you realize you think that things like celibacy or singleness is something not to be desired. Paul says that. He goes, I, I, I wish everybody was like me. And just because marriage is elevated and seen in this way doesn't mean something like singleness and celibacy is something devalued. Paul is celibate himself. He recognizes the great gifts of being able to live for the Lord in such a way. And then he addresses the widows and widowers, and he encourages them to consider staying single as well. 
as a reminder, these are broad strokes, general principles and practices executed with wisdom and discernment. It is good to know what Paul is thinking about and how he's trying to address this very specific issue. So it's important that we don't misapply this to the detriment and safety of others as well. He wants the married couples to practice selfless giving and selfless serving of one another. He wants them to understand that sexual intimacy is between a husband and a wife that is not sinful and is not some sort of immorality that they should avoid. This is to be celebrated and enjoyed with that foundation of the practice of giving, loving, and serving one another uh, beyond just in this way, but in every part of their life as a reflection of Christ's great love of his sacrifice and giving of himself for the church, his bride, as, a re- as uh, for their redemption and salvation. So it's important for us this morning to not just see this as, oh, this is just talking about sex between a husband and a wife, but this is actually beyond that. It's what does it look like for a husband and a wife to selflessly serve and give themselves to another in all sorts of ways for the picture of the gospel to be clearly seen in the church for themselves and for the people around them. Then Paul addresses another specific issue in the Corinthian church. And he addresses the issue between the marriage between a believer and a non-believer. And they have plenty of questions. And this is what the Corinthians were doing. They, They weren't sure what to do in all these very specific scenarios. So Paul as a good pastor, is responding to the, all these questions they had. So they had a question about this tension, like what are we supposed to do if there's a believer married to a non-believer or an unbeliever? And Paul argues here that our commitment to Christ as believers should guide our commitment to our spouse. Our commitment to Christ guides our commitment to our spouse. He says, to the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your your wife. In verse 10, Paul gives the general principle for the married. His language becomes more forceful with commands. And to the married, he gives uh, to the married, he gives uh, the church, and to the married, he kind of tells them, like for those in the church, this is how you're supposed to act. And he actually refers back to Jesus and what Jesus taught about it. So when he says, uh, when he says, not I, but the Lord, he's actually specifically saying, this is what Jesus actually taught about this issue. Like, he actually spoke on it. So when he says it the other way, when he says, I, but not the Lord, he's not saying that he's giving his own opinion, but he's actually distilling what, he, what Christ has said and teaching from that. So in the first part, he's actually, he actually is talking about what Christ has taught in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 9. And in that, Jesus says this. Jesus says, Have you not read that he he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they... The Pharisees said to him, why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied back to them saying, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. 
But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And so here in verse 10, Paul says, if they are separated and they should reconcile whether uh, they should either stay unmarried or be reconciled to their husbands. And likewise, for the husband to be reconciled to his wife. And when he uses the word separate and divorce in verse 10, Paul is actually using it in an, in an interchangeable way. Because in that culture at that time, there was no difference. So unlike how there's a difference for us now legally between separation and divorce, in Paul's mind, that is not what's going on. And Paul, what he's actually addressing in this passage he is something what we would call no-fault divorce. That is what he has in mind. So he's not thinking about any of the other issues that we might have. We might have a lot of questions like, what about domestic violence? What about abuse? What about all these things happen? He's not talking about those. He is giving a very general principle because a lot of what's going on at that time was a lot of this kind of what we call today no-fault divorce, people just separating. So he doesn't address the ex exception clause here because his goal is not to be exhaustive at this moment. He's trying to address the issues that they're wrestling with, and so he's kind of giving a very broad picture of, like, this is what marriage should look like, and this is why we should avoid divorce. And if you did that, this is the next steps on how to reconcile. You should be aiming towards getting back together because the way that they went about divorcing one another was already illegitimate from the start. And so that, we can see that he's giving these general principles between two believers, that if they divorce, he's saying, you need to get back together. But for the rest of them, he is talking about a very specific issue that was going on. And what this issue is, a very specific issue, he's going from that general guiding principle to this specific issue is that at this time, the people are coming to know the Lord. And normally what's happening is that there's families that are coming to know the Lord together. A husband and a wife will both come to know Christ and both become believers. But there are instances that there is a husband that becomes a believer, but the wife remains an unbeliever or vice versa. And so for Paul, when he's addressing this issue, Jesus never talks about what you do in this case. So Paul, Paul is saying, Understanding what Jesus is teaching about marriage, this is kind of the guiding principles that are extracted from Jesus' teaching. We should also note that this is, uh, these are two unbelievers that were already married, and then one becomes a believer. This is not a believer that is getting married to an unbeliever. He actually addresses an issue like that in another letter in 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, verse 14, where he tells the Corinthian church to actually not do something like that, that if you are a believer, then you should not unequally yoke yourself. But this is a different case because neither of them were believers and one of them came to know Christ. And so with that, Paul is trying to address their questions because for them, as they're reading and understanding Paul and they're learning about things like sexual intimacy and sexual immorality, the, people, the believers at that time are wondering, if I remained with my unbelieving spouse, what does that say about marriage? Is this immorality? Should I continue to stay in this relationship? They weren't sure how to apply Paul's teaching in this scenario. They didn't know what to do. They were wondering, like, do the fact that I'm remaining with my unbelieving spouse, like, am I getting contaminated in some way? Or am, am I sinning in some way? And Paul says, actually, no, that is not the case. As we understand the meaning of marriage, he says it can actually apply to that scenario even if one spouse is, only one spouse is the believer. He goes, that you can still live out this picture of the gospel even if your spouse is not a believer, but you can do your part. And for that, the believer, whether his or her commitment to Christ, they are called to stay committed to their unbelieving spouse as long as the spouse is willing to remain and stay married to that person, the believer should continue as well. We also see that the believer, the believer staying in this relationship reflects Christ's purpose for their relationship. Even though they're with their unbelieving spouse, which is what um, 
what it meant that the unbelieving husband, uh, this, this is what it means when he says that the unbelieving husband or wife is made holy, that as long as the believer stays in that relationship, reflecting Christ's purpose in that marriage, actually, the unbel- this marriage is actually made holy, not unholy. Now, this does not mean that just because your spouse is a believer and you're not a believer, that the spouse that is a believer uh, is able to save their unbelieving spouse. Because salvation only comes through faith and not through association. But what this does is exposes the gospel to that unbelieving spouse on a consistent basis that might not be as prevalent in other relationships. This is also the case for their children as well, that they're made holy in the sense that that they are able to be discipled in a way that will not be like that if uh, neither of them were believers or if they separated. But Paul does tell them to live in peace, to remain in that marriage if possible, but if the unbelieving spouse chooses to leave, that they bear no guilt in that separation. But Paul wants their commitment to Christ and their commitment to the gospel to actually be the driving force in being committed to their spouse, whether that spouse is a believer or not. And as followers of Christ, we grow in learning to honor and follow him in every aspect of our, merit, of, of our lives. And we have to give great consideration of how that plays out in marriage. Faithful and committed marriages not only honors Christ, but it paints a picture of Christ's great love for his people. And if Paul teaches the Corinthians to remain committed to even their unbelieving spouse, to stay in that tension, then how much more are we called to stay put and learn how to grow in our own sanctification in our marriages? Now, I know for some of you, or maybe even a lot of you, you might be thinking that this seems very theoretical for me. I am not married. I am young. It's not even on the horizon for me. Marriage seems so far out. You might think to yourself, what does this matter to me today? See, these are the times that we're learning to shape our expectations and understandings of marriage and how our commitment and relationship with Christ impacts and affects even our deepest of relationships. So the professor calls on me. He asks me, out of all people, why did I raise my hand? That was a really scary moment because it is one of those really large classes and everybody already kind of expressed where they stood on that issue. I was not just a minority, I was an an extreme minority. And then now I'm ready to be made a fool in front of everyone because I was expecting the professor to just publicly like shame me for my view. It was a class I kind of understood where everybody stood on all these issues and I expected this professor to kind of reprimand me on why I was ridiculous for my stance. I told them, I felt like marriage is more about a commitment, not necessarily about feelings. It's about self-sacrifice, not emotions. And I was ready to go on and try to explain because I realized how ridiculous I sounded in a moment because people are wondering, who thinks about marriage in that way? Self-sacrifice and commitment, right? Fidelity and loyalty, I was just ready to get publicly rebuked and shamed because I wanted to keep on. I wanted to keep on talking. I wanted to explain myself, and the professor goes, "Stop!" I said like two sentences. He told me to stop, and I thought, "Up oh, here it comes. It's going to be really, really embarrassing when I walk out of this class." And to my surprise, he agreed with me. And he looked at me and he said, "You must have thought a lot." about this issue. And in some sense, he was right. I did think a lot about this, and I thought a lot about what marriage is supposed to look like. Not necessarily because I was eager to get married. I was probably eager to get married. But more so because 
what, of what I saw in my own family growing up. You see, my family was torn apart by the devastation of lack of commitment and fidelity. And I saw the difficulties and the pain and suffering it caused when a husband and a wife separates in that way. You see, in my mind, I thought to myself, as I read scripture and it talks about marriage in this way, I might not know what the fruits of a marriage that looks like this, what that looks like in my life, but I definitely understand the devastation when this is not lived out. It forced me to dig into scripture at a very young age to try to make sense of it all. And I studied long and hard about this and tried to understand how marriage works and especially how marriage can reflect the gospel, how the blessing and joy of Christ can be actually seen in a marriage. You might think to yourself, you're too young. Marriage is too far out. And sure, it's true, it might be. But it doesn't mean that the shaping of your heart to be more like Christ, so you can reflect Christ in this potential future marriage, that it doesn't start today. It doesn't mean that you can't continue to encourage a brother or sister to remain faithful in marriage, to be that example of love and commitment to the body. And for those who are married here, or maybe you're in a dating relationship and you're on your way to get married, or maybe you're a newly married couple, these are important for all of us. One, as a reflection of Christ in the church, of the gospel to our congregation, for those older and for young, those younger, as in the as for us to express the intimacy that the Lord has gifted us of, self give, of, of selfish, selflessly giving ourselves to the other, selflessly serving uh, one another in a way that goes beyond just sexual intimacy, but also realizing that's actually part of it as well, things that we might not talk about too much in the church. We're seeing that all parts of this can and does reflect who Jesus is and what he has done, his selflessness and his love for his people. You see, marriage is so important because it shows the beauty of Christ. And so let's do that in our marriages or even in our singleness, as Paul shows here, or our current or current singleness or our future marriages and our celibacy right now, we can continually, faithfully live out the joy that shines bright in how we, no matter where we fall in this spectrum, that we can express and show the beauty of the gospel to ourselves, to our spouse, to our friends, to our church, and to a world that is not sure what that type of selfless love looks like. We can show them Christ in our marriages. So let us faithfully do that to shine the beauty of Christ in the gospel to each other in the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gifting us with the gift of marriage. And so many of us can be able to experience and enjoy. And at the same time, Lord, you know that it can be very difficult for so many of us as well. And Lord, I pray you encourage us to be reminded that how we live with one another can shine the gospel to the world around us. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dennis, for the sermon this morning. Um, can we all rise as we sing a song in response? Thank you.
having received God's welcome, forgiveness, peace, instruction, and communion, we respond by returning a portion of what we have been given. As Christians, we are called to give of our finances regularly, sacrificially, cheerfully to support the work of our local ministry here. Um, you can find more information about how you can do that uh, through PayPal or Zelle Pay, and you can find the information specifically on our website, vinewoodcfc.com, and you click the Give tab up at the top. Uh, before we end service today, I have just a couple of announcements. First of all, if you're new to Vinewood, if it's your first, your second, your third time, um, we would love to get connected with you. We'd love to, in particularly, uh, get you to fill out one of our welcome cards. Uh, you should have gotten one at the front from any of our ushers uh, or any member of our welcome team. You can find them if they have the uh, colorful lanyard wearing them uh, after service right outside. If you could return the card to one of our ushers uh, or return it to me, we'd love to just get you connected with a small group uh, or one of our fellowships here so we can get to know you a little bit better. And as we close our time together, two announcements. Number one, um, prayer meetings do continue to take place at 8.40 a.m. on Sundays. If you didn't come this week, no problem. We'd love to have you next week. Um, it's always going to be in the same room. It's the first classroom right upstairs on that side. Um, we do have a Zoom link that's available, but we encourage you to pray with us in person if you can at all. Every morning, 8.40, room 202, right up there. The post-sermon implementation team also has a few announcements. Lunch buddy signups, I believe, will be outside today for lunches that will take place next Sunday on the 19th. And so if you're interested in getting paired up or tripled up uh, with a group of folks that maybe aren't in your small group or your fellowship or in your age bracket, um, please go ahead and put your name down. We'd love to get you connected again with somebody else at our church. You can find those announcements and many more at our website, vinewoodcfc.com. I'd like to welcome up Pastor Dennis to close our service with a benediction. <laughs>
Will you please stand with me? Let's bow. <clears throat> now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Have a very great week. I love you. Bye. You're welcome.